Hey everyone, real quick before the video starts, I wanted to just say thank you for your interest in these videos. This series has helped me out a lot and I do have some ideas for a new season of this series. In order to do so, I feel it's best to call every video I've made so far as its own season. That way, when I do get around to making new videos for this series, it can set its own tone and theme for the next season. I can't give any dates for when it will happen, my life is a bit chaotic right now. But in any case, all I wanted to say if you do end up enjoying these videos, whether it's for the first time, or a repeat view, please give this video a like, and if you want to see more videos more often, please consider subscribing. Thank you, and enjoy! So there's a lot of shooter games out there, and I know a few people who stay away from them, mainly because of how oversaturated the market is. That being said, each game does play differently. Saying every shooter is the same is just like saying every fighting game is the same. There's a lot of nitty gritty details that make each of these games feel different. Whether it's floaty physics, smaller hitboxes, or a more realistic approach, each game feels different. It's also why someone can be great at one game and struggle a lot in another. Someone who's good in Overwatch, for example, may struggle with Rainbow Six Siege because of how drastically different everything is. For this video, we're going to look at one element that makes each of these games play differently. Maps are a big part of making these games feel great. If they're too simple or too linear, it makes the game feel restrictive or boring. If it's too open or complex, it can slow down the gameplay and make it feel too random or non-competitive. At the same time, a map may play well in one game, but not so great if they were put into another. So first, let's look at a typical tried and true layout, the three lane map. Three lane maps are the bread and butter of most shooters. You start with one lane down the middle, which is usually the most dangerous. Then you have two side lanes, and along with this you also have two or more connectors that would allow players to rotate from one lane to the next. This is Dust 2, one of the most iconic maps of all gaming. So much so that other games, typically free to play games, copy the exact same layout with some minor changes. Now why is this map played out so much, and why do many people enjoy it? Well, because the layout makes for some great gameplay. Both the middle and the right lanes can be monitored by a sniper, then the connector from the middle lane to a site, aka short, can be used for a more close-up fight. Now although this map is good, it may not work well with other games. Imagine if this map is being placed into Overwatch or Rainbow Six Siege. It may fit one game more than the other, but it wouldn't play the same way. It probably wouldn't play all that well. So we come to a crossroads with a map design, knowing what kind of shooter you're making. If it's one with heroes and flying and verticality, You'll want maps that will have sniper perches and second floors to buildings that would allow for each hero to excel. If it's a more grounded hipfire game like CSGO, then three lane maps with choke points and connectors will typically work well. That said, three lane maps also work well with other games such as Call of Duty. Shoot House is a new map that is a very simplified three lane map. This is about as linear as it gets while still being fun. But of course, we have to ask, why is it fun? Well, there's a lot of gadgets and gizmos that can be used in Modern Warfare. RPGs and explosives to clear the way, a smoke grenade with thermal optics to get some sneaky kills, and a trophy system to counter pretty much all of that. And of course, kill streaks. Because there's a lot more of to Modern Warfare than just a gun and a grenade, it allows a map like this to actually flow, and not feel too stale or stagnant. Of course, there will be times when one team is really struggling, but that can happen on any map. If we were to try again and paste Shoot House into CSGO, it most likely wouldn't work as well as it does in Modern Warfare. That's not to say it wouldn't work at all, but it is a different type of shooter. Now lastly, let's look at another category of maps. One where the three lane map layout may still apply, but typically doesn't. Realism or realistic maps try to lay out in a way that is accurate to a real life counterpart be it a factory, an embassy, or a city square. Of course, in concept, this does sound really cool. Visiting real places and running around in them. It's also cool to see them being used for a campaign or a mission and having to traverse these streets while chaos unfolds. Of course, these locations aren't really made for firefights. That said, you can look at a game like Red Orchestra. Red Orchestra is a milsim type game where they have a more slowed down, realistic map design based on real life battlegrounds. However, a realistic battleground doesn't really flow the same way as most video game shooters do. They're slow, they're very open, making it near impossible to flank or outmaneuver the enemy lines, and instead you just have to sit in the trenches, wait for artillery, and you really just feel like a pawn on a chessboard. 
Obviously, this type of map design isn't for everyone, or for every game. So let's look at a smaller example of a realistic map. So a lot of these realistic maps tend to not play all that well in multiplayer. Piccadilly is an example of this. There are liberties taken, of course, as is for most realistic maps. So for Piccadilly, they added scaffolding to one side and made some minor stylized choices for certain areas. Of course, there is a few troubling issues that make this map mostly unplayable in multiplayer. First off, there's not really a middle ground on this map. The middle of this map is empty and open. On one side you have buses and that lines up to make a narrow walkway, and on the other side you have a fountain with not really any additional objects or cover. This means that the majority of the fights are going to take place on the sides of the map, or rather, one side of the map. This makes the fights in this map become very stagnant. Everyone continues to fight in the same lane, while the other two lanes are occupied by sniper fire of some sort, or the occasional player who's trying to flank. Now everyone's going to have their own thoughts on this map, some may love it while others don't. That's it, at the end of the day, you do have to decide based on statistics. How many people are playing this map? How many people play until the end of the match? What are the typical scores? Is it one-sided most times, or which side tends to win most often? This information, which obviously we don't have access to, is what would tell us which maps are good and which ones are not. A look into Rainbow Six Siege, we have Oregon, a map designed from a real-life event. However, Rainbow Six Siege plays very differently compared to any other shooter. With that said, the map itself would have to be designed within the parameters where it would still be balanced and work. Just recently, the map was also redesigned to make it more balanced. This is really one of the better ways to work in a realistic map. Something that resembles the real thing, but still plays well. It's great to see maps based on reality make it into games, but these kind of areas aren't really designed for combat. There's a lot of open areas and too many lines of sight that would be far too difficult for the typical player to excel in. However, because of the pace of Rainbow Six Siege and the gameplay elements in it, a lot of these advantages can be taken away. It's perfectly fine if you do enjoy Oregon, Piccadilly, or any other realistic map. More power to you. Just that the game should be designed in a way so that the majority of players find the map enjoyable. I know that means a good portion of people may not get their way, but it is for the greater good. At the end of the day, it would continue to challenge these developers to create well-designed and balanced maps that everyone can enjoy. Weapon recoil is very different from one game to the next. It's a good indicator to what type of skill a player will need. For the sake of this video, we will be omitting single fire snipers and shotguns. Though some of this info may apply, we are primarily talking about fast firing weapons. A weapon with high recoil typically means that the weapon will deal a lot of damage. If you can control it, you'll be dealing more damage than with other weapons. Of course, you will have to decide if it's worth it. Keep in mind, your targets will be moving around. So not only do you have to deal with higher recoil, you will also have to track your target. When it comes to lower powered weapons, they will be faster in other regards. Faster rate of fire, faster mobility in most games, and sometimes even a faster reload system. Depending on how fast the movement system is in the game, you can determine which type of weapon you will use. If the movement in a game is very quick, like in Apex Legends, using a high recoil weapon, like the Flatline, might not be as beneficial as a low recoil, faster rate of fire weapon. The game has gotten to the point where the low recoil SMG, the R99, can only be found in drop crates instead of actually being spawned on the map regularly. That's not to say a high damage weapon isn't viable in Apex Legends, just that the high rate of fire weapons tend to be preferred. This also tends to be the biggest headache for Respawn, the developers of the game, to balance. In other games like Modern Warfare, Rainbow Six Siege, or CSGO, a higher damage weapon can work really well. In the end, it does come down to preference. However, if you do look at high-skilled players, they do tend to lean one way or the other, depending on the game. One thing you may notice if you do play multiple shooters is that the recoil intensity of a weapon is different in other games. A typical M4 rifle may handle similarly across other games, but there will be differences in damage and recoil pattern. Of course, these games are different in other ways, so it makes sense. But what I'm trying to say is that the base recoil of a game can be very different. Modern Warfare, for example, has relatively low recoil on most weapons, whereas if we were to look at Insurgency Sandstorm, which is a more hardcore shooter, the recoil for the M4 is more severe. With this in mind, it would require more discipline to have full control over the M4 in Sandstorm than it would in Modern Warfare. So if you ever wondered why a weapon in the game doesn't feel right, there's a good chance it may be the recoil system. 
A recoil pattern is made up of variables that determine how the weapon will fire. These variables will impact the recoil of the weapon, and where the bullets will go. In competitive games, recoil patterns tend to be very consistent. However, there will be some slight differences every time. Typically, this change isn't drastic enough to throw you off, but it can sometimes lead to a missed shot every so often. CSGO, for example, is being a very competitive shooter, still has some random and stray bullets in its recoil pattern. In other shooters, the recoil pattern may be entirely randomized. In the early days of Battlefield 5, each weapon had randomized recoil patterns. This made it impossible for any player to learn each weapon and use them effectively, which meant winning a firefight would be more or less a toss-up. Or you would just use the weapon with the least recoil and maybe you got a good pattern to win a fight, or maybe you got a really awkward pattern and lost. Eventually, DICE, the developers, changed these systems to have a more consistent recoil pattern. The days of weapons having completely random recoil are pretty much over. This kind of system tends to only be used in RPG games like Fallout 3 or Milson type games like Squad or Red Orchestra. There are other, more realistic games that will add recoil if you're suppressed. Meaning that in those games, even with predictable recoil, you could still have added recoil from being shot at you. As we've seen with our examples, CSGO is a hipfire shooter meaning you're using a crosshair to fire your weapon, instead of actually aiming with the weapon itself. This means the recoil patterns are based off of your hip fire, and not aiming down sight. Some weapons in CSGO do have this ability, like the SG-553, and has its own set of recoil separate to its hip fire recoil. Other games like Overwatch or Halo also use hip fire a lot. The recoil in those games tend to be very minimal, which makes for a run and gun style of gameplay. On the other side of things, we have ADS recoil, which is aiming down sight. Rainbow Six Siege, Insurgency Sandstorm, and other shooters tend to make aiming down sight a necessity instead of hip fire. They do this by having a random or very heavy recoil pattern for hip firing, but then having a consistent and easy to control recoil when aiming down sight. Depending on the shooter you want to make, would determine what recoil style you want. Do you want players to use their weapon sights to aim, or do you want hip fire to be king? Or like we see with Call of Duty and Apex Legends, do you want a little of both? Recoil patterns being predictable is a must for modern shooters. Relying on luck or hoping for a good pattern lowers the skill ceiling, and makes it very difficult for a game to be competitive. Recoil control is all about practice and consistency. Let's take a quick look at two games with the consistent recoil patterns. You'll see in CSGO, the recoil pattern for the M4 makes a T shape, whereas in Modern Warfare, the recoil for the M4 is more linear. To counteract recoil patterns to have control, you would move your weapon to the opposite direction of the recoil. So if the recoil is straight up, you want to pull your weapon down. If the recoil moves to the left, you want to pull to the right, and vice versa. Lastly, there are a number of games that uses attachments that can be placed on a weapon to make it easier to use. In a game like Rainbow Six Siege, you can really only fit one or two attachments that affect the weapon's recoil. While other games like Escape from Tarkov will have multiple slots that affect your weapon in every way. Keep in mind not every game has a system, and those that do aren't always competitive. So finding the ultimate setup may take some time, as some attachments may make the weapon worse in other areas, such as mobility and even outside time. Needless to say, games like CSGO and Valorant don't really have this system. Instead, you'll just have to use the weapon the way it is. One visual difference you may see in a shooter is the actual character movement, how fast the character can walk, run, or change their momentum. Movement is a core part of any game, including shooters. It drastically changes how each game is played. As such, each game handles this differently, depending on the type of gameplay the developers want. In order to run as fast as you can in CSGO, you'd have to pull out your knife. Of course, this also means you no longer have a gun to shoot with. Each weapon has a movement penalty to it. Moving around with it up in your hands will be slower than moving with a P90, so it's beneficial to pull out your knife if you need to move fast. In Apex Legends, you have two ways to run. First is with a sprint button, and then to sprint as fast as possible, you holster your weapons. In most games, when you are on full sprint, you generally will not be able to fire your gun. You will have to stop your sprint in order to use your weapon. There are exceptions of course, Titanfall 2 for example allows players to use their weapon in almost any scenario, but more on that later. Hardcore or realistic games, such as Insurgency Sandstorm, has a different approach with its speed, where your overall loadout affects the weight of your character. Your speed is limited to how much or how little you take with you, so if you're carrying a heavy weapon and a lot of ammo, you'll be stuck at a lower speed. But if you take an SMG instead, you'll be faster. This game also doesn't care what weapon you're actively holding, only how much gear you have on you. So regardless if you're running with a knife or a gun, you'll still be running at top speed based on your weight. Movement speeds vary from game to game, 
Some games like Overwatch or Team Fortress 2 will have speed based on the character you choose. This also happens in Rainbow Six Siege. Some of these characters may have special abilities that allow them to sprint or teleport faster than other classes, or have a unique movement no one else has. Usually, in a setup like this, faster characters will typically also have the least amount of health or armor. This keeps the game balanced by having a speedy character act like a glass cannon. One who can deal damage and zip around, but also would have the least amount of health to work with. In a game like Apex Legends, each character has their own abilities, and their own hitbox. In short, the hitbox determines where the character can actually take damage. So if the character is small, their hitbox may be larger than the actual character model itself. Respawn, the developers of Apex Legends, has been trying to address the hitbox for Wraith and Pathfinder primarily, as one is short and the other is tall and lanky. As you can see from this image, their hitbox is actually a little larger than the actual character. This is to try and make it so the character can't abuse their movement, to the point of being impossible to hit. They also added a low profile passive penalty to these characters, which means they take slightly more damage than other classes, as each character in Apex Legends has the same base health. With the changes Respawn has been making, they're planning to remove their penalty to the smaller characters in hopes that the hitbox rework is good enough. Overwatch handles health differently, by having each character have their own amount of health based on their role, and each character would still take the same amount of damage unlike in Apex Legends. Team Fortress 2 does the same thing as well, basing health on the character's class. As you can see, the movement system in a shooter affects many other parts of the game. What weapons you carry, the hitboxes, and even the health of each character. The movement system can also affect the map design as discussed before. The same way movement speed is different, so is movement momentum. Try this experiment with a few shooters. Walk or run for a few seconds, then jump. Don't press any other buttons and see how far your character actually moves from that jump. See how long it takes for the character to actually stop moving. This is your momentum. Some games like Halo have a very floaty movement system. This means if you jump, you're stuck in the air for a while. If you run, you'll take a fair bit of time to stop. This also prevents a player from being able to strafe left and right like CSGO, Apex Legends, or many other shooters. I'd also like to mention in Apex Legends, Warzone, and other shooters, you tend to strafe slower when you're aiming down sight. In Halo, the movement system can't really be abused in a normal manner. It's more of a follow of your own momentum, rather than trying to shift it to another direction. Now let's look at a polar opposite version of this. In Titanfall 2, there are many ways to continue your momentum. Not only that, but you also have ways to shift that momentum to different directions, such as a grappling hook, jetpacks, and wall running. This essentially turns the entire map into a jungle gym or an obstacle course. If you can familiarize yourself enough with the map layout, you can zip around to your heart's content. I also wanted to add it here that you also have games such as Unreal Tournament and Doom where they use a lot of movement in their games and it really is just a matter of keeping that momentum going in a straight line as much as possible. Not too long ago, Call of Duty attempted to use advanced movement in their games, Advanced Warfare, Black Ops 3, and Infinite Warfare. These movements can be things like sliding, double jumps, or wall running. This was a big change for the franchise, and as such, it was something not everyone enjoyed. As the more movement options you have in a game, the harder it can be to actually hit your target. This turns the game from being about your ability to aim, to your ability to dodge. Depending on what you want to focus, having too much momentum can be a bad thing. If it can be abused, people will take full advantage. There should be a penalty for making these kind of movements, so that they have a downside and can put the player at risk. One other thing to add about movement is the ability to cancel your animations or your momentum. Much like a fighting game, you can make micro movements and adjustments to bait your opponent to making a bad move. Uh, I have the dummy set to random guard, and one handy thing here is that I can actually use a hit confirm. So I can use the timing of the fireball to decide whether I need to press the button for the super or not. With shooters, you can also make these movements so your opponents miss. As crucial as it is to have good reflexes and recoil control, it's just as important to be fluid with your movements. These movement cancels are unique to every game, and they can be as simple as strafing like we see in CSGO or Valorant, move left, stop for a split second, then move right, and strafing works in nearly any shooter, but it may not work as well in others. It's still a great baseline mechanic to learn overall, regardless. In Apex Legends, you have the ability to slide. At any given time during the slide, you're able to jump out of this slide. In this sense, you're canceling out of your slide into another movement. You can also slide in Warzone, however, this slide is much more limited. In Apex Legends, you can slide virtually forever, 
so long as you can find ways to keep up that momentum. In Warzone, you can only slide so far. With this said, Warzone also has a slide cancel. To explain this, Warzone has two types of sprint, tactical and regular sprint. Tactical sprint is when the weapon is pointed upwards. This is the fastest your character can run, but it doesn't last long. However, you can change tactical sprints together by sliding. You would need to tack sprint, slide, then at least on PC, you tap your crouch button to cancel the slide, then tap your sprint button. By doing this, you can reach full speed again and trigger that tactical sprint. This does sound a little clunky or slow, but it's really the quickest way you can run in Warzone, outside of dropping your weapons on the ground. Apex has more crazy abilities than Warzone, which allows players to be far more creative for their movements. This can make for a very frustrating game to master. Finding the game you want to play or finding a balance is crucial to the way you want the game to be played. If you give characters too much movement, you make a very fast-paced game. If you give your characters too little movement, you can end up with a game like Rainbow Six Siege or Armor. It's also important to make sure that the right characters have the right speed. A tanky character should have slower speed or restrictive running abilities compared to a flanker or a DPS character. You also don't want your glass cannons to be so quick that it can't be touched. There are some exceptions, like Valorant, where every character has the same base health, and they all have the same base speed as well, but it's only their abilities that allow them to sprint or teleport. In this case, it's a matter of the ability itself not being abused or so overpowered that they can't lose a fight. Lastly, you also want to make sure that there are limitations to your movement system. This way, your characters aren't able to change the momentum and abilities to fly around the map, unless you want to make something similar to Titanfall 2. All of these methods can work, but they really do change the overall way the game would be played. They all require skill, but of a different kind. Movement is very important to each game. It not only affects how players will use each character, but it also affects the core design. That keeps the game balanced and fun. There's a lot of debate as to what a tactical shooter is and what a hardcore shooter is. This confusion doesn't just come from people who don't play shooters, but also those who primarily play shooters. It is something that is difficult to pin down. In my efforts of this series, I want to try and give more perspective and clarity about first-person shooters. In this case, I will also be mentioning some third-person shooters for more context. So let's start by creating a scale, grabbing a list of popular games and then placing it on the scale. The higher the game is on the scale, the more arcadey the game is, and the lower it is, the more tactical the game. Now to note, this isn't a list to determine skill, simply how these games are played. So while setting this list, let's talk about what would be an arcadey shooter. Well, an arcadey shooter is one with a lot of movement, a high time to kill, usually, and these are games like Fortnite or Apex Legends. The movement and game mechanics in these games are designed to be abused to create more speed, build objects quickly, and so on. The actual gunplay tends to be basic, but still challenging. You may not be able to just hold down the trigger, but it doesn't take much skill to hit your targets either. The big skill gap in these games are mobility and tracking. Because these characters are fairly slim and can move quickly, the challenge is tracking those movements and staying on target. We can also put Halo and Overwatch in here as well for many of the same reasons. A long time to kill, giving your weaponry and gadgets. Moving on, we have games that are more restrained, but aren't fully tactical. Not in the normal sense anyways. Counter-Strike, for example, is a mixed bag. Each weapon has its own recoil pattern, and they're not as easy to control as the previous games. In a deathmatch mode, you don't need to think at all. However, when you go into a ranked game, people change their playstyle. In this case, they're more direct about their movements, they use more throwable equipment, and come up with strategies. Much like a tactical shooter. However, the character movement still doesn't really make it tactical. When players can still quickscope and hop around, it doesn't really sit in as a tactical shooter. The time to kill in the game is also fairly low, so it's not quite an arcadey shooter either. In my opinion, it falls as a mid-ground between the two as a standard core shooter. Along this line, we also have Valorant, and although it is different, they have many similarities. Hipfire, fast-paced gameplay, and a quick time to kill. So let's start with our first tactical shooter, Rainbow Six Siege. Right away, we have a difference in character speed. In exchange for this, we have more advanced movement types, such as leaning, going prone, and repelling up or down walls. Instead of having movement abilities such as teleporting, the movement and gadgets are more intricate, putting an emphasis on using cover and the environment as much as possible, rather than trying to move around the environment as quickly as possible. With this said, Rainbow Six Siege is one of the most streamlined tactical shooters. 
to the point where players who play primarily tactical shooters will not touch the game. The reason being the gadgets, usually. Gadgets are the substitute for character abilities, and depending on the game, they can be crucial to winning each round. Just with Rainbow Six, there are so many of them, that's another layer of difficulty to remember who does what, who looks like who, and so on. On top of actually learning the gunplay, map layout, and the hotspots where players will typically be. In short, Rainbow Six Siege is a very streamlined tactical shooter that plays in its own unique way. Another hybrid-like shooter is Insurgency and its sequel, Sandstorm. Insurgency tries to toe the line somewhere between a hardcore shooter and a tactical shooter. With this said, we now have to discuss what a hardcore shooter is. So hardcore shooters are typically faster paced games compared to tactical shooters. They tend to have the speedy gameplay from an arcade shooter, with the low time to kill that you'll get from a tactical shooter. Usually you'll see hardcore game modes or playlists like in the Battlefield or COD series. So in a very short summary version, hardcore shooters are just regular shooters with less health. This is kind of the issue with saying any game in particular is only a hardcore shooter. It's more of a game mode than a full-on genre. In a way, any shooter can be easily converted to a hardcore shooter, or a hardcore version of itself by simply lowering the character's health. But not every game can fully support tactical gameplay. Just because a game can be played tactically, it doesn't mean it is. With this said, a tactical game like Insurgency can also be seen as a hardcore shooter, because of its combined low time to kill and fast-paced movements. You can also play Insurgency as a slow-paced tactical shooter, it all depends on the servers you're playing on and who you are playing with. We can also make a case for Modern Warfare 2019 to be a tactical shooter as well. Only because it can be played like one. But we know that with the movement the game has, plus kill streaks and other gadgets, it lands itself further up to an arcade shooter. If we were to talk about a more grounded tactical shooter, we can look at Escape from Tarkov. EFT removes a lot of the gimmicky gadgets and the game becomes very slow and tactical using any audio cues available and taking fights slowly. EFT has a slow time to kill, but it also has another feature. This is the wounding effect, which is different from linear health. So you can bleed out in this game if you don't heal up. Your character's body can also be wounded, so you may not be able to run if you have too much damage to your legs. This forces the player to take things slowly, as even taking non-lethal damage will still severely limit your mobility. Similar health mechanics can also be found in other realistic games like Squad, Project Reality, and Arma. Lastly, we have Nielsen games such as Arma, Red Orchestra, and Squad. These games tend to land towards the tactical side of things, but they're also made for a very specific experience. These niche games don't tend to get the same reach as others, because they're not made to be streamlined, usually. The enjoyment from these games come from just being a part of a large battle. This is a similar experience to what you can get from the Battlefield games, but the current Battlefield franchise is designed to be easier to get into and faster paced, whereas these other games are designed to be slower and more realistic. Gunplay is a crucial part for every shooter, and as we discussed before, each game handles their weapons differently, and has different recoil even if they're representing the same exact weapon. Looking at Apex Legends, there is some decent recoil for their weapons. However, the weapons are still accurate with close range hip fire and the game heavily rewards run-and-gun gameplay. To contrast this, we can look at Rainbow Six Siege, where the overall recoil is harder to control. The movement is also a lot slower paced, and the characters will die instantly with one headshot. In short, arcade-like shooters will have easier to handle weapons and encourages on-the-move gun play, compared to hardcore or tactical shooters that will reward players with better map knowledge, being efficient with their shots, and more deliberate about their limited movement. Briefly going through Milsim games, like Red Orchestra, players' weapons may handle differently if they're under suppressing fire. In other words, there may be additional elements that causes your character to not use their weapon normally. Recently, Escape from Tarkov is going to be including gun jams to their weapons, which will force your weapon to malfunction. It's elements like these that you don't typically see in mainstream games, and the reason being is because it's out of the player's hands. It's a non-skill a random element that will stop you from playing normally. It is typically a detriment for a competitive shooter to include this, since there's no way for the player to counter these negative effects. It can also be very frustrating if it were to occur in a more casual shooter as well. So instead, it's used in a tactical or Milsim type game, as they can include some of these additional realistic features. 
Again, I'd always like to stress that each game requires its own type of skill. We can not say that Rainbow Six requires more skill in regards to recoil control and map knowledge. In the same way, Apex Legends requires more skill to abusing mobility and playing at a faster pace with a more open map design. Overall, you can't learn from both games and use them in other shooters. Just that some of those skills won't always translate well to another game. So with all this homework finally done, what is the difference? Well, hardcore shooters can borrow from both sides of the scale. The movement can be quicker compared to other shooters, but still have the more intricate movements such as leaning, going prone, or repelling up walls. Hardcore can essentially break all the rules, so long as the overall player health is relatively low. I also would want to throw in that the weapon should also feel slightly more difficult than the typical arcade shooter, but with the pacing of the game being faster than a tactical shooter. Of course, we'll always have gray area games, and trying to categorize all of them can be like splitting hairs. So instead of trying to give each one a specific label outside of marketing the game, some may require to be called both a tactical and hardcore shooter, the same way some may need to be called a light tactical game. Something like Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon is technically a tactical game, but it has a lot of added elements that regular tactical players dislike. Tactical games tend to lean closer to stealth games, taking things slow, rarely sprinting around, and an overall more grounded and realistic feel. Movement tends to be more deliberate, and there's usually a penalty for trying to play fast, such as draining your stamina that could make your weapons handle worse, as well as a longer time to pull up the weapon after sprinting. These games rely more on using map knowledge and being crafty with your approach. The fun in tactical games for me is finding more than one answer to eliminate a target. Think similar to the Hitman games or Sniper Elite or the Sniper Ghost Warrior games. A tactical shooter may limit the player's mobility, but it gives players more choices to how they take the fight. The challenge from then on isn't who's a better shot, but who can use their environment, visual and audio cues to get the upper hand. So again, it isn't really a test of overall skill, so it's a different type of skill that this game rewards over others. It can get muddy trying to figure out how to categorize the number of these games. What we have to look at are the gameplay elements themselves. Players will have a fast-paced aggressive playstyle or a slower, more tactical approach in nearly any game. Game developers can only put so much restrictions to force players to play a particular way or to encourage a specific playstyle. On that merit, I think it's best to categorize each game based on these two factors. What did the devs want in their game plus how the players are playing the game. For example, if a game claims to be tactical, but has quick scoping, jump shots, and an overall arcadey movement system, we kind of have to call it an arcade shooter. Having 100 gadgets in a game doesn't make it tactical. And if the game has a slow time to kill, well then it's a hardcore shooter at best. Hopefully this kind of makes things a little easier to understand, and at least gives you a baseline for categorizing shooters. In any shooter video game, there is typically some sort of feedback that is given to the player to let them know that they're getting shot at. Most games tend to use some visual and audio cues to alert the player, while other games take it a step further and add more recoil to your weapons. A more typical alert system is having audio cues of bullets whizzing by. Before we keep going, I also want to clarify what suppression I'm talking about. When people hear that word, they'll typically think of suppressing fire where someone is firing as many shots as they can towards an enemy to deter them from shooting back. This, of course, overwhelms the person who is being shot at. With the sound of those bullets cracking overhead, it can be a lot to take in. Now we have to somehow simulate that feeling in a video game, that feeling of being suppressed. In my opinion, suppression should accomplish two goals. First is to notify the player that he's being shot at, and secondly to deter that player from standing still and firing back. It makes sense to use as many audio and visual cues as possible, but of course, not every game is trying to be 100% accurate or authentic. You don't want to overwhelm the player to the point where they're no longer having fun, or where the effects are more annoying than they are immersive. Screen shake. Screen shake. People have been asking them to remove screen shake out of the game for six years and they like refuse to do it. Like literally a universally hated mechanic except for like... I don't know, probably one dip redditor that's like, It's so realistic! Everything's shaking! It's like an earthquake! Everyone else is just like sitting there like, like foaming at the mouth with like rage. There are always going to be games that exaggerate it in one way or another, but games like Call of Duty or Counter-Strike where suppression isn't really a thing. Again, the alert isn't when the player is getting hit and the screen turns red, it's when the shots are headed in their direction. 
As attractive as going the realistic route sounds, it isn't always practical in gameplay. I'm always going to be the person who wants gameplay to be balanced. I don't ever want there to be one random gameplay mechanic that you can't counter, or one weapon to be the absolute best. I want there to be options and counters and so on. So for my personal taste, I don't really like it when a game adds recoil to my weapons simply because I'm playing a game and getting shot at. In my mind, I am playing a first person shooter, of course I'm going to get shot at. If the game isn't relying strictly on stealth mechanics, I should be able to control my character in just about any situation. Unless the game is very slow paced and trying to be milsim, there's not really a need for the suppression system to mess with your weapon recoil. I understand that realistically I would be disoriented, and, but that can be done without having to add recoil. On top of that, your weapon isn't going to magically handle differently anyways. So what is this accomplishing then? Well, it's simply making you an easier target. I understand that this mechanic is used to simulate your character freaking out, but if a game has a truly good suppression system, it should make you freak out, not force your weapons to be inconsistent. It's not a clear-cut thing to talk about because this system can work for games like the Red Orchestra series, when there's not really an attempt for competitive play, and it is more of an experience than it is anything else. On the flip side, we have Apex Legends, where the character, Bangalore, gets a speed boost once a bullet is shot in her direction. I really do like that idea of using that alert of suppression to benefit the character. Not to the point where it always saves the player, but just enough to allow the player a few extra seconds to find cover and fight back. In my previous video, I talked about suppression adding recoil can be abused by simply shooting first, even if you're going to miss, because it would add recoil to the opponent's weapon. With that in mind, I strongly feel that this isn't the way to go when designing suppression for most games. And I do want to stress, for most games. If it's for a milsim, or a strictly co-op, or a single player experience, and it's not trying to be competitive at all, then by all means, use this. If you're making a game that has a competitive scene, I don't feel this is a good mechanic. Suppression, any stealth, or milsim that affects recoil should be used to punish the player for being careless. That their raw skills are not going to be enough for these situations, and you will have to play smarter. In short, it slows down gameplay because everyone is trying to dodge this RNG effect. And I'm also going to mention the hybrid system that I thought of from my previous video, which is that if you really wanted suppression to affect the recoil, but not have it disrupt close quarters combat, then don't let the suppression affect the recoil until a certain range, say 30 or 40 meters. Any kind of gunfight you get within that distance, the suppression system will not affect the recoil, but anything beyond that range will. This could make LMGs useful for long range engagements, allowing them to be used in a more tactical way and suppress enemies from firing back. This also helps with eliminating certain weapons like a pistol or SMG that isn't really supposed to be effective at that kind of range. It still rewards the inaccurate shoot first aim later mentality, but again, the system could also be limited to slow firing weapons like a DMR or sniper rifles. I'd also want to make sure that the added recoil effect only triggers if the player is in the line of sight. So if you're trying to hit someone who's behind a solid wall or object, it will not affect the recoil. I can see a system like this being used in a more tactical and grounded shooter, one where the idea would be so that every weapon plays a type of role, and you can't just rely on an SMG with a 2x optic to get you out of any situation. Whether or not this system works, I don't know, this is just something I came up with and I figured this would be a neat compromise if you really wanted to have that kind of system. So then, we have two more options to use to simulate suppression. I feel the big selling point for suppression is going to be the audio. The audio should impact me in a way where I do flinch, or at the very least I understand that I'm getting shot at. Even if this isn't the most accurate representation for getting shot at, it can make a world of sense in a game. Having an added whiz or crack when a bullet flies by can definitely impact the player. There is, however, one possible minor issue to this, and that is there being too much sound. When you have a full lobby running around with the fully automatic weapons, it may be too much to have so many different bullet sounds going on at once. I feel it may still be doable, I mean, it definitely is, but the sound would have to be metered in a way. So you'll still hear the effects, but you're not going deaf because of it. In other words, you should still be able to hear other nearby cues, such as doors opening, footsteps, or someone reloading nearby, while someone is outside holding down the trigger of an M60 machine gun. You can also have some other type of added effects, like the character is breathing faster, or you start to hear the pulse or the heart pumping, 
just some sort of subtle but noticeable sound for that. It may not be necessary if you're using everything else, so again, try not to annoy the player too much, but outside of that, it can work. And now, let's talk about the last option, which is the visual representation of suppression. So how can you simulate suppression visually? Well, one way is to have a vignette effect. This blocks your peripherals, gives you that sense of tunnel vision, and makes it overall more difficult to see. Another way is to have a blurred effect, again on the edges of your screen. If not using both of these effects at the same time. All of these cues have one thing in common, which is to partially obscure your vision. Make it feel uncomfortable to look at, which would make it more difficult to fire back. But in a fast-paced game like CSGO and Call of Duty, you want to limit that as much as possible. As these games tend to only use simple audio cues instead of visuals, outside of like tracer rounds. Oh, we can't land it, but we can make that window. Got it! Rainbow Six Siege has a few suppression systems as well. First off, if an enemy is firing their weapon, a semicircle will appear around the center of the player's screen, pointed in the direction of the gunfire. That sludge. This would allow the player to understand not only that they're getting shot at, but also what direction those shots are coming from. In a way, this kind of system punishes the shoot first, aim later mentality, as the player will know what general direction you're shooting from. I also want to mention that Valorant has a unique way of using the semicircle as well, which is if a teammate dies while they're looking at the enemy, a white semicircle is shown to the living teammates that point in the direction of the enemy for a few moments. It's not really a suppression system, but it's a neat idea of using that kind of indicator for something similar. Going back to Rainbow Six Siege, the game also has weaponized suppression. What I mean by this is the operator, Ella, has a trip mine that when triggered releases a concussion effect. This blurs the player's vision and makes it very difficult for them to see or fight back. Okay, so from your point of view with the shield extent, it doesn't look that bad. So in this instance, we have a game that gives players a way to force that exaggerated suppression effect on an enemy by using a specific gadget. And in a game that is as competitive as Rainbow Six Siege, Ellis' gadget was not received with open arms. It also didn't help that Ellis' weapons are also fairly strong. She is a force to be reckoned with. I'm not exactly sure why Ubisoft thought it was a good idea to give her a high rate of fire weapon that also has 50 rounds at its disposal and also has a manageable recoil. You put all that together, yes it doesn't have an ACOG scope, I guess that's one thing it doesn't have going for it, but you put all of that together, you have the makings for already just an incredible operator based off of their weapon itself. Then when you take a look at her gadget, it's one of the best supportive gadgets in the game. The only way to counter reliably is if you have a Thatcher or a Twitch. If you're out of your gadgets, they took out all your drones, you no longer have any more of your EMPs because you were using your EMPs to get through the reinforcements just to get anywhere near the objective, well, you're pretty much out of luck. I cannot tell you how many times I knew there was an Ella charge on the opposite side of the doorway and there wasn't anything I could do about it. I needed to pass on through, I needed to get towards that objective, and I basically had to just kind of grit my teeth, push on through, and hope for the best. There wasn't a whole lot I could do in that situation because her gadget is that powerful. I don't like to rule out any gadget or special ability in particular, but I will say it has to be tweaked to not feel like an overpowering ability that feels too difficult to counter. Of course, Rainbow Six Siege is a live surface game, and there are constant tweaks and changes that occurs relatively often, so Ella may not have the same kind of impact now as she did before. These games are fast-paced and competitive, so obscuring the player's vision is not going to be a very popular decision. Whereas other games that want to try and find a mix, but want a competitive aspect, can have more realistic or exaggerated audio and visual effects. And then finally, for those who want a milsim experience, then by all means do all of the above to some degree. With there being a plethora of games out there that are all trying to do different things, each game has to find a suppression system that works for the setting. You don't want an over-the-top suppression system in a fast-paced environment like Apex Legends. And you may want a system that makes you flinch in a game like Squad or Armor. Suppression is like a two-sided sword. It can be used to hinder the player's ability, but also allow the player to know what's happening and in most cases know what general direction is coming from. 
And then going back to Apex Legends, you can also have games where suppression will also benefit that player to give them some extra edge to get out of that situation. One thing that makes competitive games fun and challenging to me at least, is the skill and consistency of the gameplay. Having random elements thrown in, along with excessive audio or visual cues, can be a neat change, but it can also lead to being abused and unbalanced, which can work for non-competitive environments. Weapons should feel consistent, and suppression should normally affect it, as well as the audio cues still allowing the player to hear their surroundings and stay in the fight. As mentioned before, there may be a way to create a hybrid system that works with certain weapons at certain ranges, but it is definitely something that requires testing and tuning to see just how viable that kind of system is to begin with. Overall, suppression is a core aspect to any shooter out there. Along with the immersion, it allows players to know what's going on, and be able to counter that. Lately, more so than ever, people talk about what the meta is for different competitive games. For those who are not aware as to what that means when referring to a meta, it is a combination of weapons, characters, and playstyles that tend to give players the best possible chances of success. This can be anything from a character's ability and what their ultimate ability is, to what areas of the map you should go to or avoid, what weapons are statistically better and what attachments are the best for it, all the way down to how a character looks and how they can blend into their own environment. Throughout this video, I'll be pointing out some combination of metas that existed in different games and why they do need to be addressed by the developers to change things up and fix what is broken. Let's first look into map-based metas. This is going to be a simple and quick look as to how the map can change what gear players will use. When looking into Overwatch or Overwatch 2, some maps will work better for certain heroes. The map King's Row can be easier to manage with a tank hero Reinhardt for example, and while not being impossible to pull off, it may be a tricky map to use the sniper hero Widowmaker, due to there being very few vertical areas on the map. Overwatch modes tend to move around the map or change maps after a round. If it's a king of a hill type mode like Control, the map will change after each round, whereas if it's a moving objective, such as the Escort mode, the level is larger and may benefit certain heroes more than others at different points of the map. From there, players can determine which heroes would be most valuable, either in the entire map or mode, or if there are sections of the map that would be worth swapping out to another hero for. As a side note, even when selecting an optimal hero for the map, there is always the chance that the opposing team will choose a hero of their own to counter yours, and a whole new slew of problems arise from it. Bringing this back down to a smaller and less dynamic example, let's look at CSGO. Looking at the defense side of things, when protecting the two bomb sites, A and B, the defending team setup can look something like this, where there are two players on each site, with one flex player who can watch mid or attempt a flank. Once the attacking team commits to one of these sites, the defending players can then rotate a few different ways to set traps for the attacker. Meanwhile, on the attacking side, there are various ways to break into the objective. This can be done with a full-on 5-man blitz style push to the objective, but this can also be done by using some split plays such as having three players push the objective directly while two others play mid. Or even try for a 4-in-1 split to try and trick the defending team to guard the wrong objective. From there on out, players and teams can come up with many other creative ways to defend an attack, but nevertheless it does come down to players hitting their shots. From just the map alone, players will come up with different plans and the meta will tend to be which plan works most often. While some of this can be offset by which team is performing better and getting the most eliminations, there will typically be some sort of inherent advantage for certain characters' abilities or attack routes. CSGO has been home to some maps being very one-sided, with maps such as Nuke and Train. The developers can then decide whether they want that kind of advantage to remain in these maps, or if they want to rework them to have a more balanced feel and allow more playstyles to prosper. In my opinion, every map should have some personality to it. So while there may always be a sniping lane somewhere on the map, it may not be in the most vital part to winning the match, which would make for players using more aggressive loadouts while the most dedicated of snipers continue to try and make it work regardless. Some maps should feel more like home for certain playstyles so long as there are ways to counter it, with those counters being feasible and not near impossible. Games that have special abilities such as Apex Legends, Overwatch, and Valorant will require players to select certain characters that have the best chances of winning. Having a healer is almost always a must, as well as having characters that can stall in one way or another, and characters that can teleport. 
whether it's by being a tank with a large health bar, or if it's characters with abilities to temporarily cut off areas with a wall or AoE attack. The main concern for this kind of meta is that certain characters will be invaluable, while others will be forgotten and useless more often than not. While we do want players to have the option to choose from a large list of characters, the meta may prevent players from using a subpar character. From here, the developers will have to choose what to do. Do they want to nerf the characters with a high pick rate, such as lowering their health or damage output, or should they buff characters that don't get picked? Of course we want every character to have some sort of value, but sometimes there may just be a lost cause or simply a character that has to be used in an arcade mode and not much else. There will never be a straight answer to this as it does depend on your scenario, as well as how different high skilled and high ranked players use these characters when compared to everyone else. A character can be an absolute menace to lower ranked players, while being a non-issue in higher level play. This is where the developers will struggle the most. They will have to make changes, but it can either be directly to that character, or by buffing or creating a character that would be a counter pick. In Overwatch, Brigitte was introduced with an ability kit that counters Tracer. The issue here though is Brigitte was not only a great pick to counter Tracer, she was also very reliable against the rest of the team as well, more so than other characters. This ended up with Brigitte receiving multiple nerfs to bring her more in line with the rest of the cast. Even when creating a new character to act as a counter, the new character can end up becoming the next major problem with the game, far more than what it was originally intended. While hero characters with flashy abilities are always going to be an issue, this can also affect games that are slightly more grounded, such as Rainbow Six Siege. While Rainbow Six Siege has a short time to kill with one-shot headshots, operators in this game have gadgets and gear that are critical to winning, and can also break the game from time to time. For instance, when the Operator Blackbeard was first introduced, his rifle shield, which blocks headshots from the front, had insane durability. This basically meant that Blackbeard will have plenty of time to react and pop a headshot well before his shield would break off. Blackbeard could still die from explosive or body shots or getting shot in the head from behind, but this allowed him to stand in areas where he couldn't get flanked and easily get kills. With Rainbow Six Siege also having destructible walls and windows, he could chill out by a broken wall or window and not really be in any danger. Eventually, the developers did lower his shield health so it can only take one or two shots. Before the patch though, the original shield had 800 health. As to a general rule of thumb to figure out how to balance these abilities, I'm going to tackle that at the end of the video. For now, let's move on to the last topic, weapon metas. When discussing weapon balance, we want to see what advantages or disadvantages the weapon may have, such as high power versus low fire rate and mobility, vice versa, and everything else in between. Every weapon should have some sort of risk and downside. In games such as Fortnite where there are no attachments and the weapons are tier based, balancing is going to be fairly simple. There are less moving parts and it all comes down to which weapons players are relying on to the most and which weapons are having the most success. In other games such as Battlefield, Escape from Tarkov and others have weapon attachments. These attachments can be used to change the performance of the weapon by extending its damage range, have better recoil control, or mobility, and more. So let's look into a game that includes weapon attachments that plays a large role in the game. Even if you're a casual fan of Call of Duty, it would come to no surprise that many players have heard about what weapons are meta, as well as what attachments to run. The issue with Call of Duty is that it is a casual first person shooter in nature. Granted, there are a lot of sweats in this game that can hold their own, and with the right rule set, it can become a very balanced and competitive game. However, when it comes to the base game and what weapons and gear are meta, that can depend on the kind of player you are. If you're someone with class who prefers somewhat balanced gameplay, the meta you care about would come down to SMGs, assault rifles, marksmen or sniper rifles, and maybe even a pistol. Not only do you want to figure out which of these will give you consistent results, but you would also want to figure out which attachments you can place on the weapon to make it that much better. Sometimes a meta weapon may not be that great at first, but with the right attachments, it not only becomes reliable, but also one of the best weapons in the game. On the other hand, if you're the casual player who just wants to save his way to get kills, you probably only care about shotguns, riot shields, grenade and rocket launchers, and claymores. Talking about meta in Call of Duty does typically refer to the former, but every so often there will be a joke gun that's so powerful no one can ignore it. In Warzone it seemed like every other season there was a weapon that broke the game. There was the R9 fire round burst fire shotgun that killed instantly. The DMR-14 rifle that killed in two shots. We need we need bounties. I'm gonna be huge. 
Nope, dude. I EM16 and AUG burst rifles that killed in one and a half bursts. The revolver snake shot rounds that insta killed. <laughs> and recently, the akimbo shotguns that insta killed. Yeah, I mean. Fortunately, all of these metas, if you want to call them that, have been patched. You can kind of see the pattern of what a broken meta looks like. Weapons that have a very reliable one or two shot kill capability while every other weapon doesn't have any way to compete. In any game, there will always be a few weapons that are preferred and technically better than the rest. When a weapon outperforms and dominates everything else, there's no reason for anyone to use any other weapon. Less risk, more reward. At the same time, not every weapon or gadget has to be competitive. There can always be some weaker weapons that can be used just for fun. The only concern I have is that most of them do need to be somewhere close to the better weapons in the game. Otherwise, there's little reason to use them. It's a struggle between making something unique and useful, instead of ending up making a clone of a weapon that's already in the game. Regardless, whatever weapons are preferred or statistically better, the developers should always take a look to see what can be done to rework them. The changes may not need to be drastic, but just enough to make them less reliable. Not every weapon that is meta needs to be looked at or adjusted, if people are having success with other weapons. Even so, the developers may want to mix things up just a little bit to slightly alter the meta. It can get stale if there's only one or two weapons everyone is using, simply because the rest of the arsenal isn't as appealing. Lastly, let's talk about how to balance the game overall. What standards should be looked at when the time comes to make changes to the meta? Let's just say that the game we want to try and balance has a competitive community, and the game has a high skill ceiling. With this in mind, we will want to look more at how the higher skill players are playing the game. If there is feedback from the general community about a certain map being one-sided, we'll want to check what the win rate is for that map across the board. Further, if we have additional info, we can find where the trouble spots are, where our player is getting stuck, and what can be done to expand the map and give it a better flow. That is, if any change is necessary at all. There is going to be a lot of noise and comments about the map and everything else, and as the developer who can see what's going on, you should definitely double check what's being said and look for any evidence that would suggest that the problem is indeed valid. When going through this information, always check how the map is being played by top tier players and if they're having any issue with the map at all. If they are, then chances are you will need to make a change. It all depends on what performance you're seeing. If the map is actually balanced and the win rate doesn't really prefer one side or the other that much, then this may be a non-issue. But if you see the opposite, where one side is winning far more than the other, a change may be necessary. It's fine, even in a competitive environment, to have a map be one-sided. However, it should feel more like a slight advantage rather than a guaranteed win. When it comes to characters' abilities, we want to see the pick rate, how effective those abilities are, and if the community have been able to counter them. Playstyles will differ from one person to the next, but people will lean towards the path of least resistance. Secondly, we also want to split whatever statistics we have based on the skill level of the players. If there's a ranked system in the game, players on the lower end of the scale will be playing drastically different and are usually less organized than higher ranked play, which will mean that they may not take full advantage of each character's ability, which can lead to certain characters appearing weaker or stronger than what they actually are. The actual trouble you want to look into is at their higher ranks. Then, using some caution, tweaks can be made to the abilities and weapons to be better balanced. In my own opinion, there will always be certain abilities or weapons that will just end up not being useful in high-level play, and that's perfectly fine. It just makes it all the more impressive if someone does find success against the odds. Sure, a weaker ability or weapon can be adjusted, but don't try to flip the meta around them patch after patch. It's far better to make smaller changes and fine-tune it, rather than taking big swings that can end up breaking the game. It's a difficult battle of making changes that are very necessary and implementing them ASAP, versus looking at things you yourself want to see improve. At the same time, try not to sabotage the balance that's currently in place. I understand wanting to add new things into a game that would be fun, but if something is overpowered, it will of course be fun to use, but an absolute nightmare to fight against. The fun part of the game should come from the gameplay, the weapons, and how they feel, and how useful the ability is. It should never come from something that guarantees kills and wins. 
If so, the entire community will be fighting to have that and forget everything else. If there's one thing to learn quickly is players have no honor. If something is broken, they will use it until the minute it is patched. If a character has an ability that cannot be countered, it will be used by everyone for as long as they possibly can. Normally, if an ability or weapon works really well in high level play, it is going to be amplified in lower level play. If things get to a point where it has to be addressed, you will always want the change to reflect the higher level play. With all this said, there is one other option games could have that can satisfy players of all ranks. This would be to have a different rule set based on your rank. Having two different rule sets could help make the game feel better balanced for both ends. Have a low rank rule set so that you can nerf the abilities that low tier players are struggling with, while mid to top tier players can continue on without the change. Rule sets have been in games before, such as the Call of Duty League, where basically half the gear and weapons in the game are banned to provide a more balanced experience, while everyone else can continue on using whatever they like outside of this playlist. This is also something we see in sports, where college football does not have the same rules as the NFL. Some things are changed to benefit lower level play, while not affecting everything else. If there is a strong competitive environment within the game, I feel it is in the best interest of the game and the developers to give them a playlist that mirrors what they want. Meanwhile, a separate category can be used by everyone else, and the developers can use that playlist to test out new items and weapons. The playlist that has stricter rules and works closer to high level play should not just be a ranked game mode, but an unranked one as well. This would allow casual players to try things out to see if they like this rule set, as well as give competitive players a playlist that follows the rule set they enjoy, without having to risk their rank every time they queue up or be penalized for leaving. One last thing to mention is that this will also show the developers what playlist is preferred. From there, making meta-changing decisions should be a little clearer and easier. For instance, in Overwatch 2, every new character that will be released will be banned from competitive playlists for the first two weeks of release. This gives the developer time to view how the character is being used in unranked lobbies, and whether or not the abilities or weapons are over or underpowered. It also gives time for players to get used to this new character, and come up with ways to counter them before having to risk their rank to someone or something that may be unbalanced. So with all that, I'll leave a small clip from Flats, a high level Overwatch player, as I can't really say it better myself. If they pulled I've been playing this game for many many years, through the good seconds, and the bad, point. and we're hitting the good again, and you're gonna tell me that high elo balance isn't everything. Yes it is, because if you don't balance from the top down, your game falls apart. Balancing from the bottom up kills your fucking game. It's what happened to Overwatch 1. Well, actually, to be fair, Overwatch 1, they tried to do both. Overwatch 1, they tried to balance for low rank and high rank at the same time, and it did not work. So that's all I have to say for now about this topic. Let me know what you guys think, and what do you think is actually a good idea, and what would you like to see changed. So until then, I am Mr. Rain, and I'll see you guys next time.